OK, so in this lecture, I'm going to cover the internet, the World Wide Web, and the difference between them. And uh, the, aim, the aim of this is to explain the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web, which are often confused, give you a very brief idea about packet transmission, how we used you know, headers at different layers of the internet and the World Wide Web to um, you know, uh, send packets to their appropriate destinations. And that's all this sort of OSI model, um, how we have you know, this whole stack of different protocols operating in different layers. And you know, I'll talk through a few of the more important ones for this course. So I realized that you're, you know, some of you have done a lot of studied networks quite extensively, so all of this might be super mega familiar. But I think it's important to give you this overview as part of this course to ensure that you have a, a solid understanding of you know, HTTP, TCP, and um, HTTP, TCP, DNS system, which is itself an internet scale application, and IP, because you're going to be using these kind of take these protocols and these different layers um, this term and next term quite a lot. So I think it's important um, to have a lecture that covers it. But if you're watching this and you say, ah, oh, you know, I've, I've seen 20 lectures on the IP protocol, I don't care about this stuff anymore, then you can just forward, fast forward it, fast forward the video, skip the bits you know, and watch the bits that you don't know. It's just, it's there for you to use as a resource if you need it. Okay, so the internet and the World Wide Web. So it's important to get clear on what's, what the distinction between the two is. So the internet is a worldwide, publicly accessible series of interconnected computer networks linked by copper wires, fiber optic cables, wireless connections that transmit data by packet switching using the standard internet protocol. So that's the internet. A bunch of hardware, you know, little flashing lights, electromagnetic waves moving in wires with a set of different protocols that moves the data about. Now the World Wide Web is a system of interlinked hypertext documents accessed via the internet. So it's, uh, it sits on top of the world of the internet, it uses the internet, and it's probably the size of it is made possible by the internet, but it's conceptually distinct, and I'll hopefully make that a little bit clearer. So here we have a nice visualization of the internet, all of the you know, submarine cables going out in the Atlantic, all the different bits of wire and stuff, so on and so forth. And here we have the World Wide Web, which is a set of documents um, with the hyperlinks, and they're linking to each other, and we're using the DNS system, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit of detail, to uh, connect the, you know, the human readable URLs link of the locations of these documents and um, to actual IP addresses that enable them to be downloaded and accessed. Okay, and back in the day, um, you know, when the, when the World Wide Web started, you could probably save the whole thing on a single computer and then just click on the different links and access the different things. But then, you know, over time, it's become sort of dependent and superimposed on the internet. But in principle, if you had a really large disk and a really powerful computer, you could like stick the whole World Wide Web on a single machine and it could be completely divorced from the internet. Okay, so the internet. Now, the key thing about the internet is it's a packet switch network. This is the sort of key innovation that made it possible and made it, makes it work so well today. A packet switch ne network, suppose you've got a big file or a big image, big document. What you do is you split that data up into a number of separate chunks. You give each chunk um, a little header saying where it needs to go. And then you route all of the chunks over the shared network that everybody else is using. And then those packets are eventually routed towards their destination. Um, now, each packet has a header on it, and I'll explain the different headers that are used at different layers of the internet. Um, and the header specifies you know, where it's from, where it's going to, maybe its size, it might have some checksum to ensure that it hasn't been corrupted along the way, and maybe some stuff to make sure that all the packets reach their destination together. So each packet's an individual entity, a sort of string of, uh, string of ones and noughts, and it has a header, and the Header is, again, a string of one and noughts, and a protocol is a way of defining um, the, the organization of those ones and noughts and how sh they should be interpreted as, as the address of the packet. Um, and so the packet's sent off, and then first it's sent to one router, and that looks at the header and says, oh, you know, where's this got to go? And it'll send it roughly in the right way. Maybe it's, it knows that it's destined for an IP address in China or something like that, so it'll move the packet towards China, Another intermediate router will say, oh, well, yes, yeah, China. And then when it gets past the Chinese border, 
Maybe another router in China will say, oh, well, this is actually for Beijing, so it'll send it towards Beijing. And progressively, it'll move closer and closer to its destination until it finally arrives. So the intermediate nodes called routers don't actually know how the packet's going to get there. It just chucks it in roughly the right way. So a nice analogy to this is um, a postcard, the postcard analogy. <coughs> so you've got a, suppose you've got a, a tender special him or her, um, tender special someone living in Irkutsk in Siberia, right? And they, they're just dying to read, you know, let's say, uh, a translation of War and Peace because, you know, the Russian ones that are locally available, you know, are in Russian and he, he or her does not speak Russian. So what you want to do is send this novel, this English translation of War and Peace, to your loved one in Irkutsk. So what you could do is you could copy out each paragraph onto a separate postcard. Let's suppose for this thought experiment that you have an enormous pile of postcards and a vast number of stamps that cost you very little money. So you want to send this to your loved one in Irkutsk. So you copy out each paragraph onto a separate postcard. And you number the paragraphs uh, on the postcode. So the first paragraph gets the number one. Number Paragraph number 56 is labeled 56 and so on and so forth. So we have our sequence of paragraphs on sequence of postcards. And we write the address of you know, him or you know, her address, his address, whatever, on the, on the address field of the postcard. And we stick them all in the post box, and off they go. Now, some of these postcards will sort of you know, work their way through you know, airmail, maybe, and other ones will work their way through you know, the train system, whatever. And so all these different routes, all these different postcards will make their way to Kursk. And you know, she'll, she or he will receive them in no particular order, most likely. And then, but then they can use the numbering of the paragraphs to reassemble the entire book at their destination. Um, that's what the sorting original order. And you know, it's not necessary that they're all delivered by the postal system even. You could chuck a few in a bottle and hope for the best and they might make their way to the destination. And there's no error checking in this anyway, so she's probably going to miss, he or she's going to miss uh, some of the paragraphs anyway. And this, this postcard analogy is nice in another way. So it explains roughly how packets make their way to the destination, but it also explains how headers work. So headers, so that your postcard, your postcard will have um, one typically split into two parts. Right? Let's suppose the left has the actual message and the right has the address. Now the address field on the postcard is a very sort of carefully laid out. Right? You've got the top line will be the name of the person. Second line will be like you know the cottage or whatever. Third line will be a kutsk or the, the, the city or region, and then the fourth line will be maybe the, dip, the administrative district, and then you've got the city, maybe the, maybe the country, maybe the postcode, all this kind of stuff. It's a very carefully formatted field that enables the postal service to route the postcard to its destination. And then on the left-hand side, you've got like data, which could be anything, right? Data or the postcard could be um, you know, the, the paragraph of the novel, but it could also be a picture. It could be you could stick some flowers to it, all this kind of stuff. Now, protocol is a lot like the address on a postcard. A, a protocol, so a packet is essentially a series of ones and noughts. It's completely meaningless and you know, unless you know how to interpret it. And that's what a protocol does. It tells you that the first 10 you know, ones and noughts or whatever correspond to the source where the packet's coming from. Maybe the next 10 or 16 ones and noughts, the next 10 bits, 16 bits, correspond to where the packet's going to and so on and so forth. And different protocols uh, define in different ways how you should interpret the header. So if you interpret a packet formatting according to one protocol using a different protocol, it'll be just gobbledygook. It won't make any sense. So the definition of how you should interpret the ones and noughts in the header of a packet is known as a protocol. And we use different protocols at different levels. So if applications want to talk to each other, then they use protocols like DNS, FTP, HTTP. Uh, we're not covering these two in this talk. The transport layer, if you want to send a packet from one port on, uh, to another port, then you'd use, then that's how the transport layer, that's where the transport layer operates and controls and the protocols are defined for. At the network level, that's uh, protocol, you have protocols for sending a packet from one machine to another machine, maybe a completely different part of the world. And the data link layer controls the protocols for the actual physical machines themselves. So this the IP layer is like a little bit more abstract. Maybe the IP addresses don't correspond to physical machines or something, or are dynamically allocated anyway, so they change all the time. But the data link layer is very much, you know, my computer talking to a router, a local router. And these different layers of the internet and World Wide Web um, are, are sort of related in it, but through a process of encapsulation. 
So at the very top, you have the data that you actually want to send. In my postcard example, we had the paragraphs from War and Peace. And then, and then this data, to send this data um, between two applications, for example, um, we need to wrap it up in a header, which says where it's going to, which application we're going to send it to. And then we have the actual put that data. So this is a packet that's being sent at the application layer. So we have a special application layer header on it, um, like an HTTP header, for example, if we want to send it between two applications. And then to send it, to send this data uh, between two ports on local computer, for example, we then need to add another header called a uh, like a TCP header, for example, UDP header, and that enables us to send all of this um, to, a, to a particular port on a computer. Port on computer is all very well, but what if we want to send it across the world um, to another computer in a different country? Then we need to use the internet layer, which, which controls the transmission of packets between particular internet addresses. So again, we need to add yet another header to that, um, and this header will contain information about its, um, its source and destination IP address. And then finally, we need to do all the messy stuff of moving the packet between my machine and the local router, the local router and the BT router in some telecom center somewhere, and so on and so forth. The messy process of moving it between physical machines, and that's handled by the data link layer. So we've got our data. Let's suppose it's an HTML document, and let's talk about how we can encapsulate that at HTTP, which will hopefully make things a little bit clearer. So first thing we're talk about there, HTTP protocol, and then I'll move down the layers and explain some of the other protocols as well. So HTTP is called the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's used for transferring hypertext, right, as you'd expect, um, which is like HTML documents, if effectively. That's what it's designed for, as I'm going to cover in the next talk. You know, it's actually been adapted for many different things, but originally it was for hyper transfer of hypertext. And it's a way of uh, sending a packet to a web server to carry out different actions. So if I want to retrieve a web page, then I'll send a GET request to the web server, and the web server will send back uh, like the web page itself, like a response. Or if I want to submit the data from a form, you send a POST, post HTTP uh, message, and, and so on and so forth. We'll go, go into this in more detail in the next lecture. It's an applications protocol, and it's generally you could send the messages, if HTTP messages, using TCP IP. But you could also send them, you know, using postcards, right? You could use, it's a protocol, uh, that's all it means. So you could use this protocol at any kind of, you know, using pigeons and bits of paper. You could use it by, you know, yogurt pots and a piece of string. It doesn't matter. You can, it's convenient to use TCP IP, but it's not necessary. It's just a definition of the messages and what the parts of the message mean. So this is a little bit of an example. So here we have our client. Let's suppose this is a browser, such as Chrome. So this is one application, and here we have the HTTP server. Let's suppose it's the Apache HTTP server sitting there on a machine somewhere or other um, waiting to receive our messages. So initially, we, use, we send a request message, get, um, which is a get message in this case. So what we're doing, so this is the header, this, this bit here, and this is the body. So if we're sending a request, we don't need to have any body. We're just asking for something, so we just have to send a message that's pure header. And the pure header just has like get, and then the, the web page that we actually want, and a few other bits and bobs that you know make, make it all work. So we send the GET request to the HTTP server. It receives that GET request, looks at it because it knows how to understand that protocol, and then it sends an appropriate response. And this response has like a you know, 200, which means that it's OK, it's found the resource, and then it's got um, the actual, and this time it has a body, and the body contains the HTML that I've requested here. So, the definition of this header enables this client to talk to this server, request a particular page, and this server then to reply with the contents um, that I've requested. That's the HTTP, but then how do we actually send it to another uh, application or another, or another computer? Well, we do that using the transport layer. We wrap the HTTP message, so all that header and the body, they all get wrapped with another extra TCP header. And TCP protocols used to send data reliably between applications. So I'm going to cover TCP and UDP in more detail, both in the lecture on online games and at the beginning of next term, because you're going to be using TCP and possibly UDP um, for your second mini projects. <coughs> so uh, this is only going to be a little bit of an overview. 
So the protocol is used to send data between applications, it's, and it's port-to-port -port communication. You're sending data from one port um, to another port. It's not got anything to do with computers or IP addresses. It's purely port-to-port -port communication. Now, TCP is a sort of reliable protocol. It has various mechanisms to ensure that the entire packet is sent, that the packet has the right amount of data in it, and it enables you to work with um, do things like file transfer, email, and, it's, and you can work with streams of data and this kind of stuff. So it's designed to produce high-quality, accurate, high, high quality accurate data transmission. Its downside is that it can be a little bit slow. It can introduce delays and this kind of stuff. So for some time-critical applications, people prefer to use UDP. So TCP works between two ports. Um, a port is a bit like uh, a sort of an address on a computer. It's not like a hole or a socket where you plug a, an actual physical wire in or anything like that. It's like a, a conceptual address at the level of an operating system. So it's like a bit like a PO box, let's suppose, on the, on the um, postcard analogy. So the port, ports range from 0 to 65535, it's a 16-bit number, and you have services listening on specific ports. So the HTTP server might listen on port 8080, you might have a database listening on, I don't know, 102, 102 something, whatever. So each, often you have services listening on the ports, and then when they receive a, a, a connection, then they do whatever they do, like send some data or reply, reply with an HTTP uh, response or whatever. So this is the header. This was stuck on the end of the HTTP uh, message. So we have a source port number, 16-bit, and a destination port number. So it's all this header has is information about communicating between two ports. And you've got various bits and bobs in here that enable the reliable transmission information. And here at the bottom, we've got the actual data we want to send. So that's TCP, which is all well and good. But it, what if we want to reach a computer somewhere else on the internet? Well, then we need to use the internet protocol. And often people talk about TCP IP because it's a combination of the port plus the internet address. So to send something over the internet, then we need to wrap this TCP packet in yet another header, in this case, the IP header. And the internet protocol transmits data between two IP addresses. And these IP addresses can be located anywhere at all, really. That's the, the beauty and the magic of the IP protocol, right? So IP address we use to locate a specific machine on the internet. So as, as you know, you know, some of these can be statically allocated or dynamically allocated. You can have like subnets with dynamically allocated sub addresses and all the rest of it. But it's a bit like a phone number, really. That's how to think about it, I think. So if you dial this number from anywhere in the world, then you reach the International University of America, this place I used to work. So that's like a unique number linking, you know, that can be used to locate a single phone anywhere in the world. And similarly, if you type 74.125.224.72 into your browser, then you're going to get to the Google website. This is like a unique, um, it's pretty, pretty fairly unique uh, address of uh, a particular computer somewhere in the world. And there's this transition from IP version 4 to IP version 6. So this is like a, what, 32-bit number, I think. And, you know, it it's kind of doesn't have quite enough space for the large number of uh, devices that are around today. So they're introducing this IP version 6, which is a 128-bit number, which has much more, you can have many more devices, and, so, and that's why we're currently in the process of transition to IP version 6. So it's the IP header. So as I said, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a header that uh, enables us to send a message from the, the one particular IP address to another IP address. And again, there's various bits and bobs in there to ensure that there's reliable transmission and there's no corruption in the data, and there's the data at the bottom of the message there. And finally, we've got this you know, packet that we've wrapped in the TCP, we've wrapped it in IP, and finally we've got the data link layer. Another header chucked on top of it, and that enables us to communicate between two real physical devices. So, um, which have, and in this case, the address is the MAC address, um, not the IP address or something like that. So a MAC address is called a media access control address, and every single machine on the internet, in theory, has its own uh, unique MAC address. In theory, because you can spoof the MAC address, pretend to be another machine and this kind of stuff, but generally it stays fixed, and you should generally regard it as staying fixed. So if you've got two network cards on a computer, each one of those network cards will have a unique MAC address. And it allows each device on the internet to be uniquely identified, and this is like in it so that we can shuffle the packets about between um, individual machines, routers, across Wi-Fi, and so on and so forth. So if I want to send a 
a packet from my computer with its own particular unique MAC address to the local Wi-Fi router, then that'll be one hop using the data link layer, and then it'll rewrite the header to send it on to the next hop, and so on and so forth. And so this is the header that we're going to put on. You just have the destination MAC address, source MAC address, ether type, and probably a few bits and bobs as well. Yeah, well, there you got the checksum to make sure the data's not corrupt, and then the actual data. Okay. So that's my little sort of potted version of the internet and some of the protocols that work at the internet. Now I can talk about the World Wide Web and a little bit about how that functions. So Tim Berners-Lee is credited with, uh, you know, inventing the World Wide Web when he worked at CERN. You know, a bunch of physicists, you know, needed to move some data around. He invented the World Wide Web to do that. And the World Wide Web works through a combination of different technologies. So we've got the HTTP protocol, which I've talked about. We've got the hypertext markup language which is used to sort of format and structure the documents. And we've got the URLs, which I'm going to talk about in some detail, which are a way of locating the documents um, using human-readable identifiers, like google.com instead of the IP address of Google. And then we've got the domain name system, which, enable, which does the mapping between the URLs and the actual IP addresses of the documents themselves. OK, so if I want to get a, a web page, um, I need to send a HTTP get message to the web server, but how do I find that web server? Well, I could just use the IP address. I could remember the Google IP address, type it into my browser, and, and send a GET request to that web server. This has many limitations. Um, it'd be almost impossible to maintain websites because people would move, move their IP, change their IP addresses quite frequently as they move hosting and so on. So it'd be a complete nightmare um, to have to update any links that you had in your document because you'd always have to change the IP addresses to match the current ones, and you wouldn't know that they changed either. Um, and there's various other reasons, which I'll go into in a little bit later. But to avoid all these kinds of problems, we've got the domain name system, which is a beautiful system that will convert a simple human-readable URL with various carefully defined um, structure, which I'll go into in a little bit, and it converts that into an IP address. So all I have to remember is google.com, type in google.com, and then the domain name system will resolve that to an IP address, and then my computer can uh, contact the actual physical computer to get that document. So anyone, any computer in the world can map, can use the domain name system to map a um, URL onto an IP address. So domain name system maps domain names, such as google.com, to IP addresses. And this is called host name resolution, because the host i.e. The, is the place that hosts that particular website. And it's used for a variety of protocols, such as HTTP, FTP, email, and a few other ones, probably WS, I'm guessing. So if you want to send an email to this location, how does, how does my computer find david.example.com? Well, what it does is use the domain name system to find the host that will accept the email for this, and then the host itself will probably do the resolving at the David level. But the example.com email will be resolved by the DNS system. So there's lots and lots of advantages to the mainline system. So it's obviously a lot easier for users. They don't have to think of like four numbers separated by a dot when they want to browse the web. They can just remember the names. As I said, it's been impossible to maintain HTML documents because people, you know, people can buy and sell domains, which means the IP address will change. They might uh, update, they might shift hosts um, so that they'll be hosted on a different machine. You've got all this fancy stuff I'll come to you later with uh, Akami and caching and so on, where again, you're changing the IP address to enable the caching. So if we were based on IP addresses, it would be a total nightmare. The DNS system makes everything much easier, makes the World Wide Web really operate at a global scale. And you can even have a market in domain names, which you know, might be a good thing. And it's much better for users to type in the URL. And you can also, and there's various bits of the URL which are very useful as well. So back in the day when this all started, all it, you, know, you had a single file that had all of the IP addresses, presumably in one column, and then all of the URLs or domain names on the other side. Um, and you just downloaded the file. Maybe it was updated every day. I don't know. And then you, your computer could use, use that file to find the IP address that it needs. And in Linux, I think you can have a hosts file, which works very similar to that. But today, it's a very large distributed system. So the domain name system is itself an example of an internet scale application, which I'm only going to sketch out very, very briefly now. But yeah, if you, you know, could, could go into it in a lot more detail. So it has this hierarchy, the DNS domain hierarchy. So at the top level, you've got things like com, net, org, and so on. 
um, like the sort of the end bit of lots of different country top level domains. Then you've got second level domains that you maybe register, where what you register is like davidgamez.com or .net or whatever, microsoft.com. But the second level domain is the sort of the sort of more human readable user specific thing. These are fixed, right? There's a certain limited number of fixed top level domains, whereas these can be anything, any, anything that fits into the requirements of the URL. And then we have additional names. You can add like example.microsoft.com or you know, music.microsoft.com or, or, or whatever. Those are the second, those are the subdomains. So top level domain, the sort of last bit. Second level domains, the bit that you can register with your, your, you know, your name or whatever. And then the subdomains, which as I explained, are more, more under your control. So here we have the, the root, which is maintained by the internet root servers. These are the sort of machines at the very top of the internet, of the DNS system. And then you have a set of DNS servers that handle the different um, top level domains. Then you've got second level domain, um, again being the sort of people who sell domain names be handling these, I imagine. And then you've got subdomains, which you could probably handle yourself or the people who uh, host your host or your, the company that you register your na domain name with might, might handle these subdomains for you, if you, unless you're really big. So it's very simple. I mean, uh, there'll be a specific protocol for this, which I'm not going to cover here. But the, the basic way in which this works is that you, you type in google.com into Chrome or something like that, and then your computer... Um, in your network settings, we'll have a DNS server, a preferred DNS server, and this could be set manually by you, but it's typically set by your internet service provider. So your computer will take your URL, and it will, and it will send off a message with specific format to the DNS server that's been configured in its, in its network adapter, and say, you know, what's the address for host.microsoft.com, whatever, and then the DNS server will send back, like, the IP address, um, having done its uh, lookup of that IP address. So this is sort of roughly the process. Um, firstly, you use locally cached information. So this stuff doesn't change very often. So given the huge number of uh, domain names, DNS searches that are, the DNS resolutions that are carried out each day, you know, it makes sense to cache it, and it's much faster for your computer as well. So you've probably got like a bit of local caching going on, and then you'll contact, you know, another DNS server if you haven't found the information you need in the cache, or the cache is expired. And then the servers themselves will contact other DNS servers to resolve, the, to resolve the domain name in a sort of recursive manner, which I'll briefly explain. And then eventually they'll find the result, send it back to your local, the server that you're in communication with, and then that'll send the result back to you with the bits of caching all the way along the way. So this is roughly how it works. So we've got the preferred DNS server. This is one that's configured in your, in your computer. So your computer first contacts that. And then that'll send off a message to the root domain, root DMS server, if there's a bunch of those for the entire internet, or World Wide Web. And then this will contact the, um, the top-level domain servers, like the com, eu, whatever. It'll look at the, the end of the domain name that you're trying to resolve. And then it'll contact you know, the second-level second domains, second-level domain, the servers for the second-level domains, and then it'll find eventually, and then those in turn will contact the ones for the subdomains. And then the, once it's found the result it needs, it'll, this will apply to this one, apply to this one, apply to this one, and that'll eventually send the result back to the user. That's why it's called recursive query resolution. It's kind of stack process. Uh, and as I said, there's caching to reduce the lookup time. And this caching operates several levels, layers of the internet, um, or several layers of the DNS system. And so it can take a while if you register a domain for it to actually appear globally. So because all of the caches have got to be updated, maybe they do that every day or so, and so it may take a while before it actually works on a global scale. All of this is overseen by ICANN. It's a not-for-profit organization, and it oversees all of the unique identifiers that can enable computers on the internet to find one another. So it coordinates the domain name system, you know, which top-level domains and all this sort of stuff. It accredits people who register the second-level domains, and it oversees, um, you know, the top top level and root name servers, so the big machines that sit at the top of the top of the internet, and coordinates the allocation of IP addresses. And I'll switch over to IP version six, presumably handled by ICANN. So all of this seems like fairly large and alien technology, but it's perfectly possible to set up your own DNS server at home. So companies will often do this if they want to uh, resolve specific 
domains within their company network. So it might be more convenient for them when a person types in accounts for them to pull up a particular web page on a particular machine, for example. Whereas if you type accounts globally, it'll pull up all kinds of stuff. If you just, you could have your own domain name server that would resolve accounts to your own specific machine within the company network. And if you typed in something else, it would then do a specific cert, do a domain DNS uh, resolution um, it, using the external servers or whatever. And so if you want to set one up at home, you can do the, you know, there's various ones, free ones out there. I think Linux can do this using a host file from what I remember, um, which is very simple to use indeed. As I said, they often use, the companies often do this. So what the domain name system is doing is it's mapping a URL or parts of a URL onto um, an IP address. And the structure of the URL is very tightly defined, and so I'm just going to go into that in a little bit more detail. So there's different types depending on the protocol, and there's different parts of it, some of which are resolved by the domain name system, and some of which are handled by your local server. So depending on the protocol, you might have like an FTP, a URL, HTTP, email, and probably a couple of others. So let's just have a little look at HTTP URL, and this is going to help you when we come to the using servers, servlets rather, and servers as well, because they, you know, interpret, they're, they're sort of geared to interpret very specific, different parts of this um, URL. So the first part is the protocol, right? So it's an HTTP message, you know, we've seen the sort of get, we'll go into all this in a lot of detail in the next lecture, whether it's a get or a post or delete or whatever, and the sort of response codes and all this kind of stuff that's defined by the HTTP. So the, ser the, the server knows what to expect if it's an HTTP message. Now, www is a little bit, little bit tricky um, because it appears to be the World Wide Web, but it's not. It's a subdomain of the Google.com domain. So w, the reason it's tricky is because if you um, get some web hosting, typically www.david.com or whatever will point to um, like a public HTML file on your, on your web host and so it sort of seems to be like it's pointing to the World Wide Web. But in fact, www is just a subdomain of google.com, and it could point to and kind of many different other kinds of subdomain, like mail.google.com or you know, hats.google.com. It, it doesn't really matter. And the subdomain, um, when you register a domain, I think at least with me, I registered my domain name, and then in the control panel of that, I could set, the, I could set up subdomains um, within the... Uh, control panel of the web host or of the domain name registration company. It might be possible in the web hosting company. Some companies resolve their own subdomains themselves. It just depends how you how you do it. And you can register. Uh, you can point a particular subdomain to a particular folder or web location. You can probably point it to a particular server that interprets it in a particular way, and so on and so forth. So when I was working at the International University of America, I registered a subdomain that held the the course material for the courses I was teaching there, for example. Okay, so the subdomain, and then we got the second level domain and top level domain, that's the google.com, which is what you pay to register. And then we got this uh, slash search. So this has no longer got anything to do with uh, the DNS or anything global really. This is um, something that be interpreted by um, your web server. So if you had a static website with all your pages laid out nicely into different folders, um, you might have you know, index HTML, and then you might have uh, a folder saying search, and that folder would, would also have its own index HTML and so on and so forth. So in that case, this is going to point to a particular folder uh, on, your, on your web server, on your, in your file structure, in, in your, you know, in your uh, public HTML folder. But in bigger companies, um, that's, that's not the case, really, because we're using scripts or programs to interpret the URL dynamically. So I'm going to explain next term about how you... Uh, can create your own Java web server in the context of the Internet of Things. And this Java web server, what you do is you register particular contexts, and this would be a context according to a Java web server. Um, and so if you have a URL that has ends with slash search, it would execute one bit of code, and if it ends with slash info, it would execute another bit of code, and so on and so forth. So in that case, they wouldn't po point to folders. They'd be used to, um, the program would use these, um, the end of the URL, this bit of the URL, to, in, to carry out different commands. It would be instructing the web server to do different things depending on what this, this field was. And finally, we've got the query string. So we've got the, um, you know, this is a particular query. Q, it's a series of field value pairs. 
And it's basically a set of data that the URL, we're sending to the server using the URL. So query strings are a series of key value pairs. So we have, in this case, um, we have query equals IP address. That's like probably because this is a search I was doing on Google for its IP address. Um, starts with a question mark, and then there's a series of field value pairs. So let's suppose um, this is like a ferret fan site, right? I might send a query saying species equals ferret and name equals Andrew. And what it would do, the, my server would then interpret that query string, look for a picture of a ferret called Andrew, and send back, you know, cute little picture of Andrew, maybe with a bow tie, something like that. So the separator with this ampersand, so we've got species ferret, that's one field value pair, and then the ampersand it means that that's another field value pair there. And in the servlet, you can just get this query string using get query string. It's got a nice method for doing that. So in this course, we're going to be using these different technologies to build internet scale applications. So we're going to have HTTP-based web services. We're going to use TCP, UDP for computer-to-computer com communication. So there's some nice sort of more extended treatments of this, if it's not familiar to you, um, in the course book, in the various different course books um, that I've given you. And, and that wraps it up, I think. So as I said, this has been a a brief summary of some of the core sort of network technologies, which you're probably already familiar with, but I've given it to you just in case you're not. So, and you can use this as a resource if you're not fully understanding, you know, when you come to the TCP or UDP parts of this course, this, might, this lecture might be helpful to you. So, cover the different network layers, some of the protocols and dressing methods used on the internet and World Wide Web, explained how the DNS system maps the name, domain names onto IP addresses, and next lecture we're going to go into the HTTP protocol in more detail, and then talk about how we can use Java servlets to handle HTTP requests.